We'll take a minute to set our motivation, uh, again using Shakyamuni Buddha Mantra, and then just sitting and reconnecting for a moment. Taya Taya Om Mune Mune Maha Bunai Soha Taya Taya Om Mune Mune Maha Bunai Soha Taya Okay, nice to see you all. Um, I hope everybody is uh, getting used to the new, the new normal and um, finding ways to have fun with it even. Even though we have concerns, um, maybe there's also some benefits. So um, last week we were talking a bit about um, faith and conviction and why refuge is useful and necessary even if it's a secular refuge, even if it's just an inner connection with your own qualities. And we also talked about the connection with um, Buddhist ideas of the guru and Buddhist ideas of refuge, together with psychoanalytic ideas about the self-object, uh, particularly the idealized self-object. So that's kind of what we ran over the top of in a, in a very summaried way um, last week. And I wondered before we continued on if, um, if people had interesting ideas come up about those or connections or questions. The no. same, this whole situation is very Buddhistic, I think. The whole corona business is teaching us something very deep, something you try to teach us all in the, la the first semester. And now it's sinking in, you know, nothing is uh, sure, nothing is stable. Everything is so deeply connected that just one butterfly in uh, China affects one uh, <laughs> can create a tsunami. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One soup of this bat, the bat. So it is very Buddhistic, and maybe the refuge is a somewhere safe to think it over, or rethink it, or be connecting with it. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right, and I think there's something uh, very useful about times like this where there is a, a shared distress to ask ourselves what can we bring to it and what can we connect with. Um, I think it's really useful time. Yeah. yeah, what else came up for people when we were talking about these ideas? Does the, the Buddhist idea of refuge having a cause and the cause being a healthy fear of your own untamed mind and what it can create for yourself and others and a faith based in reasoning and experience that there are tools offered that you can understand and integrate. And that is what gives you protection from suffering. Does that premise sit well with you? Does it even you know, relate to things you knew before you met Buddhism? Is it something that, that resonates? Do you think you need a refuge? Maybe Yuntin, if I can say that the usually we, we are looking for a refuge when there is a, a fear from something outside like what's going on right now so 
it doesn't uh, naturally connect with the situation now. It's not my, not my, my untamed mind. It's an illusion, right? But uh... yeah, it's it's interesting um, because there's the situation, but then there's our response to it. And what's going to protect you from anxiety? What's going to protect you from being superstitious? What's going to protect you from being blasé and not care and careless about it? What's going to protect your mind from negative states in general, but then specifically when there's like a heightened level of conditions for stress? You know, what's going to protect you from uh, having an increase in your agitation of mind and because of that, having less skillful choices, less skillful, you know, speech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because there's kind of our baseline rational mind that we want to bring to the forefront of any interaction internally and externally. We want to bring kind of the best of ourselves to any moment. And the more conditions there are to kind of pull us away from that more rational mind, that more heart-centered mind, anything that pulls us away from that means that our capacity to be of benefit to others is less and our capacity for personal well-being is less. So, uh, so engaging with refuge means that it's like a preemptive strike against all of the additional conditions in this world that might pull you off track. And of course, you know, the, the outer refuge is important too. You know, we want to have a safe environment. We want a clean, hygienic environment, et cetera, et cetera. But that's in a way secondary. Um, you know, first is this inner orientation of how do I maintain connection with the best of me and my development so far in the face of whatever arises, in particular, this heightened level of stress. Um, so, so that's what we mean by refuge, even though the word refuge colloquially is much more related to taking shelter physically. In Buddhism, we talk about um, finding safety internally, safety from our own habits that are negative. So, so refuge is a really important concept to, to explore, even if you don't come to a conclusion that you want a Buddhist refuge, that your inner refuge is just something more secularly described like your ability to connect with compassion like your ability to connect with love or peace or wisdom or whatever it is it doesn't have to be described in buddhist terms but um i think that that looking at there might be a necessity if we want to be of benefit to others there might actually be a necessity to having an inner refuge of some kind um, and probably we already do. We just haven't framed it that way. And once you um, start looking at a framework that you might call a refuge, it's must, much easier to connect back into it and then radiate from it. Um, otherwise, it's like on a good day, you bring your best. On a bad day, you don't. But it feels a little less under your own control because you haven't consciously organized your mind. You know, a lot of Buddhism is noticing where your mind is and then consciously organizing it so that it will bring out the best of you. Um, and I think that, that that can be very powerful for your family, can be very powerful for your coworkers, can be very powerful for your patients. But for you as an individual, you have a more happy and meaningful life, right? So, so the basis of a lot of our work is connecting with some sort of refuge, even if it's not a Buddhist refuge, um, but having a healthy fear. Fear is a strange word, but a healthy um, assessment that your mind left to its own devices doesn't always make you happy or skillful. You know, you want to sit with how you are on a bad day and freak yourself out a little bit in a healthy way, but a little bit of right i don't really want to live in that place where my mind is like that it's not nice for me it's not nice for them you know it's a healthy fear right those days when you get swept up and busy and frenetic or those days that you get heavy and complacent or dissociative that's not where we want to live and that's not where we want to operate from so so fear you know of this type that i'm describing is quite useful um, but it has to go together with a conviction that your mind is trainable. Otherwise, you're just worried about being in a bad mood and what it's going to do to you and others, and you're just worried and there's nowhere to go with it. 
you know, you also need the faith in yourself, in your own ability to reconnect, in your own ability to transform. And that's just built on assessment of your memories and assessment of how you've already done that in your life to a huge degree. There's many skills that you've already developed. It can just be more intentional, can be more intense and powerful if you organize it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are there, are there arguments that come up about this? Like, um, like uh, sometimes when we talk about refuge, people feel like it feels too artificial and fabricated and it should just be something very natural. And if it's not happening, then it's in a natural, natural way, then it's not good or something, or um, it's not good to force your mind to do something it doesn't want to do, or these kind of doubts often come up for people. Um, does anyone have any worries of that type? I guess as psychologists, maybe it's confusing because we do believe that, a, I don't know, we're not supposed to train ourselves, but to heal ourselves or to grow something from inside and not to hold something from the outside. Um, and I'm thinking like, what? Well, what's the difference between refuge and like an anchor? Because a lot of the times we get all kinds of anchors that we hold to, but it's different than having a refuge. Um, so I In think it- hmm? In what way different? I think that when you have an anchor, you're much less uh, free and m mobile because you're holding something very like it's sort of an attachment i guess like if my anchor is um i don't know being successful or um being a good person but like something that you hold very tightly and you have to hold it to survive I, and I think it's different than having something much wider that you, that is your like um, home. But it is confusing when you're talking about training, it is, it sometimes it feels for me that it clashes. Mm. Even though it does make sense to me, but I do feel it clashes with something I'm brought up on um. yeah uh, and, and i think it's um that's the rich place is when you can find your resistance that's the rich place if you're just sort of going oh yeah it's a nice idea sort of works sort of doesn't anyway what's next it, it has very little impact on your own mental development i think it's it's really important to even seek or encourage doubt because that is that is the um the threshold of transformation is when you meet doubt and when you meet resistance. Um, otherwise, uh, there is doubt and resistance that's sort of unknown to you, but you feel it as a um, just kind of a drag or a pull in the background of your inner work that um, prevents you from moving forward with the depth of the concept because intellectually the concept is not that difficult to understand. And then you wonder why you understand it, but don't experience it. You know, because there is this little like background war in the back of your mind between uh, things should come naturally and flow organically and be unfabricated and not artificial. And then I have to organize my mind. I have to consciously set my motivation. I have to connect with my refuge and I have to speak from that place. And you're like, both of them make sense in a sort of in a certain context. And so I'll sort of do half of them or neither of them. And they just kind of live in ambiguity. So it's, I think it's really important, this, com this conversation that, that we're having to really bring up what is, what is my, uh, the contradiction that I feel or what is the resistance that I feel, even if you can't resolve it right away. You know, allow yourself to look at both camps and the benefits and disadvantages of both camps and just kind of see what inner resolution you come to without needing to feel like you're choosing sides. It's more about an inner resolution of both that's quite individual and very internal 
but allow yourself to kind of go back and forth between the two ways of operating and see, um, see what works for you. Yeah, but allow yourself to doubt, encourage yourself to doubt, um, explore where there is resistance, don't be afraid of resistance, because um, it is the threshold between knowing and understanding, or uh, understanding intellectually and actually integrating. So you have to make yourself go up to that threshold of doubt, otherwise it just kind of lives in a murky somewhere. There are some uh, <clears throat> uh, psychotherapy uh, theories and techniques that do build uh, refuge in more uh, concrete way. There is, for example, the SE, somatic experience, which is a theory uh, that work with trauma. And they start their uh, therapy by building first, uh, you can say some kind of a refuge, a good calming refuge before you talk to people about their traumatic experience because uh, they want them to go back when it's too heavy or too stressful. In psychoanalysis, uh, we usually don't build in a formal way uh, such a refuge. We hope, I think, especially in self-psychology that uh, uh, there are uh, self-object uh, transference will re, uh, relieve uh, the refuge quality in the ideal self-object that maybe was, uh, was destructive or wasn't, didn't work well. Uh, but it's uh, more something that is built, you said naturally, naturally with the flow of the therapy and not, and not uh, structurally like in Buddhism. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily organized and explained to your analysant beforehand. Here is what we're doing with transference. Ready? Go. You know, you're not like setting them up with the structure and the framework and say, now we are at step one, you know, because that would be odd and probably not work and be kind of off-putting. Um, and yet there is that happening within you as the analyst um, of, you know, I think we're kind of moving into this area or I think they're connecting in this way. There is an inner structure within you as the analyst, I'm guessing, even if you never communicate that or articulate that in words to your patient, right? It's there. It, and we would say that inner framework, the more and more developed and integrated and conscious it becomes, that is a type of refuge. Yeah, it's, you know, your place to enter into and then speak from, whether in words or in energy or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, in Buddhism, it's like you're not trying to force yourself to believe something that you don't believe, but you are also not afraid of trying something you're not sure about or have resistance to. And it's a different sort of thing, right? It's not forcing, it's noticing that there is there's a pushback to a certain idea and going with it anyway and just seeing what happens and seeing if in that pushback that you feel, it gradually releases and then becomes a part of you. It's very much like physical exercise where if you're lifting weights that are more than your capability, you'll hurt yourself. But if you lift weights that are very, very easy for you, it's not, you're not gonna get a heightened level of fitness very quickly. You know, so you need to find a level of weight that's a little bit uncomfortable, but not painful. Yeah, and that, that that kind of point of resistance, that is the place where strength is trained. And so if you can frame it in that way, maybe it helps. Other thoughts about refuge or questions? Yeah, and it's a question that will repeat our whole life, I think. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's an important question. But, you know, again, to just keep it very um, concrete and clear, the reasoning, and then we can flesh out the experience of it. The very concrete part of the reasoning is that negative states of mind, afflictions, are incorrect related to reality, right? They're not in accordance with reality. They go against the flow of what is true, 
positive states of mind are in accordance with reality and are in the flow of the truth of interconnection and the fact that things are empty of inherent existence. And so cultivating positive states of mind um, is rational and is um, in alignment within a way your true nature. Whereas negative states of mind are what are called adventitious or extra, additional, removable. They're like contaminants in a stream. So, if, you know, again, if you think of the mind as like, you know, a clear, clean river, the, the river is eventually going to flow to the ocean, but it meets different bends that sort of um, keep it from its final destination of the ocean. And there are things that make it go even slower, like mud and silt and, you know, different, um, different curves. So think of the mind as it's always been water, it always will be water, it's always clear and knowing, reflective, and able to carry many things. But right now it's carrying a lot of contaminants, and the contaminants are what is halting its progress to the sea. Does it make sense? You know, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's, you know, useful. Or the, the mind is like the sky, class, uh, you know, vast, radiant, clear, expansive, and there are clouds in the sky, but the clouds are not the sky. And so uh, when we're trying to look at that kind of analogy, we're connecting with the fact that purity and spaciousness and reflective abilities exist despite the weather. The weather is there, it obscures the mind, but that doesn't mean it takes over the mind and becomes one with it. Yeah, so even in the worst storm, you can go up above the clouds and there is that clear spacious radiance. Um, so these two analogies, whether it's water works for you or sky works for you, depending on what kind of hippie you are, no, um, but depending on what, what kind of poet you are, um, try and touch into that. There's mind and then there's the things that get contaminated in the mind. There's the mind and then there are the things that can develop the mind. And it's very much related to the emptiness of inherent existence. So, you know, keep asking the question, but, but sit with the answer for a while before you ask it again. And, you know, please keep asking it, but, but kind of let some of these ideas permeate it and see where they land, because it's an important thing to look at. And then in terms of experience, there's some things it's like you cannot unknow them. Yeah, once you've learned them, it's like you cannot unknow them. Um, so it's showing that a certain kind of wisdom can overcome the ignorance that preceded it. Um, you know, there could be a very difficult neighbor next to you who is always, I don't know, noisy and shouting and blah, 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 and it's disturbed your mind for years. And then you come to find out the background of their household situation, and you come to find out the background and the story of this person. And now all of that noise is in a whole different context, and it doesn't affect you in the same way because of your knowledge of it. The conditions remain the same, but they no longer have the ability to harm your state of mind. It's like you can't unknow the suffering that built that habit. And because you can't unlearn it or unknow it, it protects you from the ignorance of why you let it get to you. So there's a lot of examples like that we could look at, but, um, but try and think in terms of experience of what you've already touched in your mind so far. That there are things that once you learn them, it's like you can't unlearn them. Yeah. Superstitions and things that are incorrect, it's like you have to forcibly remind yourself to keep them. Yeah, and there's a kind of agitation around them. They're not in alignment with reality. So they might come up very spontaneously, like naturally, spontaneously from habit, but there's an agitation around them that clouds your mind. Things born from wisdom don't cloud your mind. Um, there's a clarity and a relaxation together with that wisdom knowledge. Yeah. So yeah, so sit with it. Um, so um, let's go to the text, page eight. And um, this is all from the jewel ornament of liberation. Um, and we're on chapter one, the primary cause. The primary cause is the essence of the well-gone one, meaning Buddha nature, meaning the emptiness of the mind. 
So this section, we're talking about disposition, and we're going to start this conversation about disposition and about um, different people's affinities. So we know that um, all sentient beings have a mind that is clear and knowing. We know that all sentient beings have Buddha nature and that all sentient beings have innate ignorance, right? Those three things all sentient beings have. But then there's this infinite variation of how we experience life and how we respond to life and what encourages transformation and healing. There's this huge variation because beginningless time, right? We've accumulated all sorts of habits of various types. We've met with different conditions and responded to them in different ways. And so in Buddhism, we wanna look at first identifying these different dispositions and then looking at how can we reach each one. So in identifying each one, we're not like putting one down and raising one up, even though they're described that way, right? We're, we're basically saying any of us could wind up in any of these dispositions. Any of us could have winded up with any type of, you know, learning style, personality, et cetera, et cetera, if we'd met the same kind of conditions. But here, um, we're sort of saying, here's a harder disposition to work with, here's an easier disposition to work with, or here's one that has more affinity with healing, and here's one that has less affinity with healing. Let's just identify that that's the case, and then let's see what we can do about it. Um, so it'll sound kind of like, wow, Buddhism is really looking down on these poor people. But in fact, it's just identifying what the state of affairs already is. So don't bring in kind of a looking down connotation to it. So if you go down um, page eight, halfway or three quarters down the page where it says, by what reasoning, that's where we're reading from. So it says, by what reasoning can it be shown that sentient beings have Buddha nature? because all sentient beings are pervaded by the emptiness of dharmakaya, because there is no differentiations in the nature of suchness or emptiness, and because all beings have a family. For these three reasons, all sentient beings are of the Buddha nature. The unsurpassed Tantra says, because the perfect form of the Buddha radiates, because there are no distinctions within suchness, and because they are all in a family, all sentient beings are always of the essence of enlightenment. So there's a lot to unpack here and, and we're not gonna try and squeeze it all into one session. Don't worry, we'll have time to kind of sit with each of these. But um, this is kind of tying back to our discussion of the basis, path and result. Remember the basis, the two truths, relative truth and ultimate truth, the path, method and wisdom. And then the result, the two Buddha bodies, Dharmakaya and Rupakaya. And the Dharmakaya was then split into two. That which is naturally present, the emptiness of your mind, and that which needs to be developed by realizing emptiness. Right? So if you can kind of remember that chart, um, that's kind of where this conversation is living. So when it's saying that all sentient beings are pervaded by the emptiness of dharmakaya, it's talking about the nature truth body, the svabhavik kakaya, and um, that's the one that's naturally present without effort from beginningless time. Okay, so to explain the first reason, all sentient beings are pervaded by the emptiness of dharmakaya, means that ultimate Buddhahood is Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya is all pervading emptiness and emptiness pervades all sentient beings. Therefore, all sentient beings are of the Buddha nature. Saying there is no differentiations in the nature of suchness means that the suchness of the Buddha is identical to the suchness of sentient beings. None is better or worse, none is bigger or smaller, none is higher or lower. So because of that, all sentient beings are of the Buddha nature. All beings have a family means that all sentient beings can be categorized into the five families of the Buddha. So the five families of the Buddha, there's a sutra presentation of the five families and there's a tantra presentation of the five families. So we're gonna do the sutra presentation for a little bit and then we'll do the tantra presentation in a, um, kind of a accessible way that's um, appropriate to people who are not Buddhist, um, as long as you remember the proviso that there's a lot more to this story for people that practice Tantra. So we'll do an introduction to Tantra and the five Buddha families in a few days. Um, so right now the sutra presentation, they, what are they? The summary, the disconnected family, 
the indefinite family, the hearer family, the solitary realizer family, and the Mahayana family. These are the five families of the Buddha. So we'll start with the first one, disconnected family. First, what does disconnected family mean? It refers to those who have six traits, such as no concern for what others think, no modesty, no compassion, and so forth. The great Acharya Asanga said it in this way, even if they see the suffering and faults of the vicious samsara, they are not moved. Even when they hear of all the great qualities of the Buddha, they have no faith. They have no modesty, no thought for what others may think, no compassion at all, and do not experience even a single regret when they repeatedly commit non-virtuous actions. Those who maintain these six attributes have no chance to work toward enlightenment read the fine print, right? So they have no chance to work toward enlightenment. In that life, or while they carry that tendency, not forever. And so it's, I'm, I'm guessing that in your life you have met people like this, yes? You've met people who absolutely are not moved when they see the suffering of others. Most people, if they see someone else suffer, they have a degree of compassion and a degree of selfishness, right? And it's different degrees, higher percentage for some, lower percentage for others. But there are some folks that when you meet them, they could not care less about the suffering of other people. They've hardened their heart, right? And there's a lot of psychological reasons for that. And there are a lot of karmic reasons for that. And we would say that um, the reasons described in psychology are absolutely reasons. You know, they had some traumatic history or they had some brain injury or they have a developmental issue or et cetera, et cetera. Any number of conditions can be why this person has hardened their heart. But those same conditions might result in a person who has not hardened their heart. Why is that? because they didn't have the karmic predisposition for those conditions to be conditions. So you know what I mean? So why is it that one person can be sexually abused in their childhood and as an adult be a very compassionate, loving person who will do nothing but protect children and another person who's sexually assaulted as a child becomes a pedophile themselves, right? The same trauma leading to two behaviors. I'm sure you see this all the time, right? Or you hear about it all the time. And of course, there's a lot of other factors. Of course there are, and we're not negating those. But I think it's very interesting because we often point to that's why they're like that. Yeah, that thing that happened to them is why they're like that. But if that was the reason why they were like that, everyone with that would turn into this. And we know that's not the case. We know there's almost infinite variation in how people respond to trauma. And yet, most of the time, that is traumatic, that event, yeah? But it could be that in some cultures, that is not even considered traumatic, yeah? It's quite an interesting thing. I, you know, I uh, remember when I was a teenager and trying to do um, human rights work. In Montana, the main human rights work revolves around the Native American population, which is, you know, not a huge minority, but it's our biggest minority in Montana. And we have seven different Indian reservations. And so we would do these um, like youth activism, youth empowerment workshops, and there'd be all these Indian kids there. And all of the girls had lost their virginity by the time they were 10 years old. All of them there. You know, we were just doing an end of the day, you know, girls in a sleepover pajama party, let's talk about boys sort of a thing that, you know, girls do. And all of the Indian girls had lost their virginity by the time they were 10 years old. And most of them did not class it as a traumatic event. That's what was interesting to me because of course I'm the child of a therapist and my mother is a very strong feminist. And so my assumption was, oh my gosh, that means all of these girls are incredibly traumatized and it's gonna affect the rest of their life in negative ways beyond all imagining. When in fact, only a couple of them would have said it was traumatic. Now it's interesting because who are we to say? But I remember then, you know, years later, a woman like this in my life um, who had uh, had very intense um, sexual experiences as a very young girl, got pregnant, had a child, and never called it trauma in her mind, met a bunch of white social workers who said, what happened to you was rape, what happened to you was bad, and then she became traumatized. 
right? Because of how someone else categorized her experience. Now, this is a big whole conversation and there's a lot of um, pieces to argue with here and a lot of conditions. And um, you guys work with this stuff a lot more than I do. But I think that the point that we're talking to here is that there are a lot of reasons for someone becoming of the disconnected family, right? And a lot of those reasons are something that we could talk about and point to. And a lot of those reasons from a Buddhist perspective are riding the wave of habits from previous lives. And that's why for some people, transformation is really not gonna happen very quickly. And for some people, transformation can happen with the right conditions. So if you're meeting someone of this quote, disconnected family who has like lost their compassion, right? They have no compassion. Uh, how else do they say it? No modesty. You know, they might be a very like rude character. Um, someone who uh, doesn't have any regret when they do the wrong thing. They might even be happy about getting away with it and find themselves clever. You know, someone who's really gotten into a negative set of patterns. They're not a lost cause, right? They're not a lost cause at all. But I think that there's something useful in identifying them in this way because it means that we're not gonna hit our head against the wall trying to use methods that work for other people not of this family. What do you think about this? Have you, have you met people that would fall under this, this category? Whether in work or in life or in your family? <laughs> think that, uh, hi, hi. That if someone from this family will come to a therapy, we always uh, will see his potentiality. Absolutely. All because they came to therapy, therapy right? Because <laughs> already they came to therapy. And maybe, so and maybe, and maybe even if they don't come to therapy, I thought uh, that we, it will be good to remember their poten potentiality, what you teach us about the Buddha nature. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, we, when we're looking at this content, what we're really trying to do is manage our expectations. Yeah, because as it says down below, um, this is also explained in the ornament of the Mahayana Sutra. There are some who only commit non-virtuous actions. There are some who constantly destroy positive qualities. There are some who lack the virtue which leads to liberation. So those who have no virtue do not possess the cause of enlightenment in that life. But then the commentary says, generally it is said that those who have these attributes consist of the disconnected family. They will wander in samsara for a long time, but this does not mean that they will never achieve enlightenment. Right? This is the thing to highlight, but this does not mean that they will never achieve enlightenment. If they made the effort, eventually even they would achieve enlightenment. The Buddha said in the White Lotus of Great Compassion Sutra, Ananda, if a sentient being who otherwise had no chance to achieve enlightenment would visualize the Buddha in space and offer a flower up to that image, the result would bring that being to nirvana. Eventually that person would achieve enlightenment so for him, nirvana is attainable. And what it's really saying is that even one tiny little action of positive action, like offering a, little Buddha, offering a little flower to the Buddha, even one little good thing is enough to nourish that Buddha potential, right? To nourish it and help the seeds of it sprout and help development progress. And so if we're meeting someone of this disconnected family, we're not wanting to um, drag them kicking and screaming into enlightenment because we couldn't anyway. We're trying to see what's one small virtue they could possibly do. Something so small, something that doesn't seem significant at all, but becomes the catalyst or becomes the beginning of the momentum for transformation. So to, to start so tiny, what's one small thing they could do? You know, can they get a pet and feed it regularly? You know, something, right? This is enough and that should give us heart. This is enough, one small thing is enough to kind of set up the spiritual path for them and to start awakening and ripening that Buddha potential. So, um, so rather than trying to um, use your most advanced techniques or your best work, start with something so small to get the ball rolling. Um, I'm also thinking yeah. maybe 
which I think I should be careful because it's influence. If this, if I around, uh, surround myself with friends from this disconnected uh, family, and I want to go in another way, it may influence. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot of um, teachings about that, that um, we become like who we surround ourselves with. And um, especially at our level, we're very easily influenced by other people. And there's sort of the heart of what we'd like to do with our path. And then there's all of our you know, old kind of reliable temptations that are kind of less than, and if we're surrounded by people doing that, then we'll just fall back into our old habits or even become worse. Um, eventually we want to be strong enough in our path that we become a positive influence in whatever group we are in. But right now it kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes we're the positive influencer, sometimes we're negatively influenced, sometimes we're positively influenced, but it's a lot more variable when we're beginners like us. Yeah. Yeah, what else does this bring up for you, this idea of the, the disconnected family? Well done. I would like to say something about uh, this wonderful verse of uh, the Buddha from the great uh, the white lotus of great compassion. It reminds me this wonderful story of a code concerning uh, Hans Scholl, the German student of the <coughs> of the resistance of the white rose in Minken in Munich. Uh, he, he was traveling as a soldier in a train. And so the, the train stopped uh, for a while and uh, he saw a couple of uh, women, enslaved Jewish, Jewish uh, ladies working on the field uh, nearby the, 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 the rail station. And he, he, he get down, he got down and uh, approached one of the of this lady and uh, took out from the ground a blue vice uh, flower and handed it to her and gave her his uh, his chocolate uh, piece of the of this uh, soldier uh, meal and she threw down the, the chocolate and uh, took the, the flower and when, and she was quite contemptuous about uh, his gesture, but when the train left, he saw her uh, put this flower in her hair. So I think that this uh, kind of uh, engagement between the perpetrator symbol, although Hans uh, Scholl himself uh, wasn't uh, of this kind of disconnected, he tried to connect it to the Jewish uh, girl, but this, uh, this moment was a moment of uh, connecting be between people in spite of the disconnection of these groups. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, it's beautiful. And it gives you heart, right? Because even, even if the, the positive action isn't well received, there is something that is received that is positive. You know, whether it's seen or unseen, it, there's, still, there's still an effect even these smallest things. And, um, you know, for our own selves so that we don't become of the disconnected family to remember that too, that some days you just do what you can do and what you can do is very, very small. That doesn't mean it's meaningless, mm. you know? Yeah. So, um, so then we have the, the indefinite family on page 10. And so the indefinite family, um, the nature of the indefinite family depends on contributory conditions. If they attend a hearer spiritual master, associate with hearer friends, or study different hearer texts, then those persons will awaken the hearer family. They will study and follow the path and become a part of the hearer family. Likewise, if those persons meet with a solitary realizer or a Mahayana master, then respectively, they will become part of the solitary realizer or Mahayana family. So this is very similar to uh, what Rahali was saying about who we surround ourselves with. 
And um, so someone of this type is basically very easily influenced by authority figures, right? Very easily influenced by authority figures. Now, I, I'm guessing that a lot of you have, have done something Buddhist before you met Human Spirit Program, right? You've done something Buddhist or you wouldn't have come. You read some book, you went to some class, maybe you did a lot of study, um, but something preceded meeting this particular format and I think it's interesting to look at that sometimes what you meet isn't necessarily what you have the affinity for. And sometimes what you meet just becomes how you identify without any thought about it. Um, you know, I remember that uh, I started in the Zen tradition, right? When I was a kid, I started in the Zen tradition and I'd learned to meditate in the Zen tradition. And I went to a Zen group every single week from, you know, 12 years old to 16 years old, something like this and went to Zen retreats and got a lot out of it, but it was the only Buddhist in town. That's why I went to the Zen group. I didn't have actually a Zen affinity. I loved the Dalai Lama. I loved everything Tibetan Buddhist, but there was no Tibetan Buddhists in town. So, you know, it was like um, I was of the Mahayana or the Tibetan affinity um, and I found the Mahayana Zen and that was good enough. That was definitely good enough. Even though it's perfect for some people, it wasn't perfect for me but it wasn't that just being with them was enough to kind of change my pre-existing tendency towards the Tibetan stream. I think that it was, it's also possible that I could have met the, the Zen tradition and because that's where my first home was, I would have sought it ever after. You know, so it's like whatever you're meeting, are you just kind of in this mood of I'll go with whoever is in authority or are you gonna go with where your affinity is or do they come together? It's an interesting conversation for ourselves because we don't want to force ourselves into alignment with a tradition that doesn't suit us, but also just because something doesn't come easily doesn't mean it's not the right thing for us. So this indefinite family is something really interesting to explore because some people are of a very natural Mahayana disposition and some people are a very natural foundational vehicle disposition and all of it is important and all of it leads to the same result eventually. But if you're um, kind of feeling like, I love Buddhism, but there's other types of Buddhism where I feel a flow, where I feel more home, it doesn't mean that you're looking down at the other traditions. It just, you haven't, you haven't gone into the one that's your kind of affinity or your style. Um, so this is for people that already have kind of an affinity or a style, right? But lots of people, it's like, well, whoever's teaching, let's do what they're doing. Yeah, and there's pros and cons to that approach, isn't there? There's pros and cons to just, yep, yeah, okay, so I'm at a foundational vehicle center and that's where the teachers are, that's what I am and that's who I am and this is my home. And you just go with it because that's what's happening. There, there can be a lot of good work that happens with that approach. And when it no longer feels like the right place to be, you can move to somewhere else or not. But I think the, the difficulty with this indefinite family is that it's, not taking as much personal responsibility for your own choice of path. And I think when you take personal responsibility for how you decide you want your path to play out, there is more power. And there's more like emotional independence, you know, for lack of a better word. There, there can be, um, I think, yeah, more power if you are more intentional with, I didn't just meet this path and that's why I'm doing it. I've met it and I've decided it's the right thing for me. What, what do you think about that, this indefinite family? Maybe it can make part of development. Part of development, did you say? A developmental process and, and uh, um, until you know what is what is what is right for you. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So yeah, so maybe we're all of the indefinite family initially, and then our affinity becomes clearer over time. Yeah, maybe it's a developmental stage. That's that's a good insight. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other thoughts about this, or thoughts about. Um, our relationship with authority. <laughs> I think there's a lot, a lot of, uh, 
a lot we can do with talking about our relationship to authority and relationship to authority and hierarchy and Buddhism is a, is a really huge conversation and a very important one to have with yourself as an individual. Because if you have a kind of authoritarian personality, then you seek out authority figures and you seek to become an authority figure. And that has a lot of benefits and a lot of disadvantages. And um, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of disadvantages. Um, and yet there is something organized about structures who develop in that way. There's something that can become more efficient and ways that it can become more corrupt. So, uh, so I think just kind of, you know, taking a step back and going, hmm, yes, authority is an interesting thing to look at with its relationship to the spiritual path. We know about what authority looks like, I don't know, in the military or in the government or in whatever, whatever, but what is, um, what is the role of authority and how it functions or dysfunctions when it meets the spiritual path. It's a whole other kind of interesting place to explore. So anyway, put that on the back burner, ask questions if you like. Um, then we'll go to the Hearer family. Okay, so the Hearer family, um, this is a foundational vehicle um, family. The family of Hearers consists of those who fear samsara and yearn to achieve nirvana, but who have little compassion. It is said, one who is afraid upon seeing the suffering of samsara and yearns to achieve nirvana, but has little interest in benefiting sentient beings. These three are the marks of the hearer family. So it's someone that understands there is a cause and effect relationship between their suffering and their state of mind. They, they understand cause and effect. They, they realize that their own suffering is not um, from the external world. The external world is a condition for the ripening of inner seeds, which is why they suffer and have afflictions. And so they're very much um, organized with their ethics, very organized with their ethics of non-harmfulness, very organized with their ethics of, um, you know, trying not to try not to be a negative influence, things like this, um, but it's very self-referent. Um, it's a bit like people who follow the laws of the land because they don't want to get in trouble, as opposed to people that follow the laws of the land because it leads to a more healthy and functional society, right? And how can I be a, a good member of society and contribute to the health of society by abiding by laws that I think are just and true and confronting those laws that I think aren't just and true. And it's a more expansive kind of way of being someone who follows the law as opposed to someone who is a very good citizen and, and follows all the rules, but it's because they don't want to get in trouble. It's a bit like that. So it's, it's, it's connecting with the spiritual path, but it's with a little bit narrower focus. Yeah. Um, the solitary realizer family is also foundational vehicle, but like, quote, superior, right? Just, you know. So the solitary realizer family includes those who possess the above three attributes, and in addition are arrogant, keep their master's identity secret, and prefer to stay in solitary places. So they're superior in the sense that their intelligence is said to be sharper, but they're not necessarily nicer. Okay. So fear at the thought of samsara, yearning for nirvana, little compassion, arrogance, secretive about their teachers and enjoying solitude. A wise one should understand that these are the marks of the solitary realizer family. So um, the below section, um, have a little read after class. It's quite um, uh, short and easy to understand. but we'll flip over to page 11. And um, here's the important part. Okay, so um, dropping down where it says, as said in the White Lotus of Sublime Dharma Sutra, likewise, all the hearers think that they achieve Nirvana, but they have not achieved the final Nirvana revealed by the Buddha. They are only resting. <laughs> Right. So it's saying basically, you can be of the hearer family or of the solitary realizer family and finish your path and become fully um, uh, in, in nirvana, one with nirvana, the state without sorrow. Um, it's achievable, but they're not done. <laughs> they're just resting. So this is what we call the extreme of peace. They're abiding in the extreme of peace, 
But don't worry, <laughs> there's more to the story. When these hearers and solitary realizers are well rested in these states, Buddha understands this and encourages them to attain Buddhahood. How does Buddha encourage them? He awakens them through his body, speech, and wisdom mind. Through wisdom mind means that light radiates through the Buddha's wisdom and touches the mental bodies of the hearers and solitary realizers. As soon as the light reaches them, they arise from their unafflicted meditations. The Buddha appears physically in front of them. With his speech, he says, O oh, you monks, you have not finished your deeds. You have not finished all that you are supposed to do. Your experience of nirvana is not the final nirvana. Now all you mo monks have to work toward enlightenment. You should attain the realization of the Buddha. And from the White Lotus of Sublime Dharma Sutra, you monks, today I declare, you have not achieved the final nirvana. In order to achieve the primordial wisdom of the omniscient one, you must cultivate great perseverance. Through that, you will achieve the wisdom of the omniscient one. So basically it's said that even someone who has attained nirvana at some point still will awaken to full and complete Buddhahood, full and complete enlightenment, but it's through the influence of other enlightened beings. Um, in the Lam Rim Chenmo, it said the Buddha will exhort them. And um, the nuns that are at the nunnery where I did my training, we always joke that it'll be like our teacher when he thinks we're asleep in class. If he thinks we're sleepy, he bangs the desk and he goes, oi! <laughs> And so that's what it'll be like when the Buddha exhorts you. <laughs> the Buddha will go, Oi, wake up, finish your path. And it's interesting because so many of our visualizations that we do are about bringing light in and sending light out. And it feels like it's on the level of imagination. And it is for the most part, but it's training us to be Buddhas, right? It's training us to be Buddhas, sending out the conditions that will inspire people to continue their path sending out the conditions that will inspire people to continue their path. That's what we're doing as ordinary people. That's what we're going to be doing as bodhisattvas. And that's what we'll be doing as Buddhas is basically integrating qualities and then sending out that which will help other people do the same. Not by forcing, not by um, controlling, but by inspiring and providing conditions. So it's an interesting, Think to what, um, you know, just kind of sit with it, see what you reckon. Um, if you want to um, finish reading this page and um, have a look at the Mahayana family, we'll do the Mahayana family on Wednesday. So if you want to read ahead, it's going to be pages 12 and 13. Um, but I thought we would finish with just a little um, recap of the different types of faith described in Buddhism. So, and you can bring all the questions um, that might come up in the next couple days, you can bring them up um, on Wednesday after it's had time to kind of digest. So um, for those of you that already have your Buddha nature book, I don't know, does everybody have it yet or not quite? Um, on page 55, there's a note that talks about the three types of faith. So they are clear faith, the faith of conviction and aspiring faith. So the other day we were talking about blind faith and um, how there are some benefits and a lot of disadvantages, but still it can function towards a few steps along the path to transformation, but it's not where we want to live forever. These three types of faith are not blind faith. Okay, so what it's saying is the first, clear faith, focuses on the marvelous qualities of an enlightened being with a vivid sense of appreciation, which makes our mind bright and a vivid um, excuse me, marvelous qualities with a vivid sense of appreciation, which makes our minds bright and clear, dispelling disturbing emotions. So this clear faith is like when you're inspired by the example, right? You're inspired by the example of someone who you see doing work that you value, and it kind of helps you reprioritize and let your, you know, less high priorities fall away and you get clear vivid inspired focus a bit like this so this type of faith and then i need my glasses that's why i can't read there we go <laughs> all right so our uh, mind becomes like water in which the mud has settled the faith of conviction arises when we gain certainty that the practice of the paths will yield the promised insights and that we can rid ourselves of mental stains so this is basically confidence that rides the wave of your previous development. 
because of what you've tried so far eventually works, you have confidence that if you continue to put in effort, it will work. And then aspiring faith is the strong wish to practice in order to gain these realizations and to rid ourselves of fault. So it's very related to refuge. So, um, so this page 55 in the notes, um, there's a lot of really good notes in this book actually, but we'll um, explore this book a little further, um, you know, in a few weeks, but for now the notes are just kind of interesting. And this one had uh, notes on page 55. So we'll just um, finish and just let everything kind of sink in and touch the heart and then see what you can take from class today into the rest of your day. So just <clears throat> setting down the book, reconnecting with your heart, using the breath to focus.